The first trailer for Channel 5's psychological thriller Anne Boleyn is here, and it looks amazing. The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I shall be making a video I literally did not want to make, but my audience forced me to. The topic being Channel 5's Anne Boleyn miniseries, due to air later this month. In all honesty, I thought the bar had been set as low as it could with Spanish Princess, but judging from this Anne Boleyn trailer, I think we have found one that is even worse. Much like Spanish Princess, I will be going through the trailer section by section, looking at the historical facts and then discussing them. Before we look at the trailer itself though, I think it would be useful to go through some of the background information to this production. If you want a slightly more detailed look, then I have done two unscripted videos covering this and also Becoming Elizabeth, links below. Briefly though, Channel 5 announced last year that they were going to make their own drama looking at the downfall of Anne Boleyn, which was then filmed in Yorkshire in the second half of last year. According to Ben Frau, the man in charge of commissioning the series, this project reframes her story as a propulsive psychological thriller, told from a new perspective. So be prepared for Cape Fear Tudor Edition, where Henry will ruthlessly hunt down Anne Boleyn. Only one thing can save her now. <laughs> this adaptation also decided to go down an unusual route with its casting, leaving many displeased, including myself. I've said this in numerous Tudor rants before, but it bears repeating here. Authenticity is important if you want to fully immerse your audience in the world you're trying to create, particularly one that was very real, and had a major impact on our history to this day. Film and television are different to the theatre, and this medium is more reliant on believability. I cannot see how anyone can watch this and take it seriously as something representing the past. I have complained in the past about Catherine Howard always being blonde in more modern Tudor dramas for some reason, despite having auburn hair. I have complained about Henry VIII being very miscast, whether in terms of appearance or how he sounds. And now I will complain about this. I'm sure Jodie Turner-Smith, who has been cast as Anne Boleyn, is a good actress, but at a time when the entire leadership of England was not diverse by modern standards, it is very jarring to see Channel 5 go this route. Funnily enough, I now find myself in a position where I am defending Star's media, something I never thought I would be doing. At least their upcoming drama, Becoming Elizabeth, that they are currently filming, focusing on the early life of Elizabeth I, they have done a really good job with the casting overall, particularly with Bella Ramsey as Lady Jane Grey and Romola Garay as Mary I. I mean, just look at these pictures here. They look very accurate compared to their historical counterparts, and really help you believe that you're watching this time period. Scripts depending, of course. They do have some diverse casting, but only for roles that make more sense from what I can see, such as this mercenary called Pedro from Spain. You could have done something similar with that Channel 5, perhaps having a John Blank style character, Blank being a Moorish herald serving Catherine of Aragon, and then entering Henry VIII service, but there we are. Of course, I think Channel 5 has some other reasons why they're doing this, but we'll get to that later on. Some of the defences of this have been rather... interesting. And you will forgive me for showing you all just a few comments taken from the wonderful world that is Twitter. What's even funnier is that this story has been told so many times. This casting is a welcomed refresh to a tired old story. Now whilst I do agree Anne Boleyn's story has been done a bit too many times, I don't see how chucking all authenticity out of the window is somehow refreshing. You could do so much more without changing the casting, for example, focusing on her fallout with Thomas Cromwell, her hitherto ally, which has never really been explored in film much, save for Wolf Hall to some extent. All those people freaking out about Anne Boleyn being played by a black woman were remarkably quiet every time Jesus was played by a white man. Because that has nothing to do with Anne Boleyn? Personally speaking, yes, I would love a series on the death of Jesus that went for a more authentic cast. So what now? Just because the casting of a completely different character was wrong in the past, does not mean it is suddenly okay to do the same thing to get revenge or something. 
As someone who has spent a huge portion of their life researching and learning about the Tudors, I must say this, good. We have seen Anne Boleyn played a million times. Change things up a bit, otherwise it's boring. Well, sorry, Genevieve Brijold, Natalie Dormer, Claire Foy, etc. You are boring now. How is this even an argument? It's boring unless we heavily change historical roles? No, that is utter bollocks. There's always something you can do different and still remain authentic to the period. Also, I'm seeing a trend emerging here. You'll have people like this claim they love the period, yet, at the same time, will trash it as boring. I've seen it a few times now with the Philippa Gregory cinematic universe and its defenders, and it annoys me to no end. More on that in Tudor Rant Part 5, coming soon, TM. This is a really interesting period of history. It is certainly not boring in the slightest. Yeah, but does it really matter? Really? Who cares if her performance is good? It's got everyone talking about it, though. Hope that wasn't the sole reason behind the casting. The actress playing Catherine of Aragon in The Spanish Princess isn't Spanish, so... Well, Charlotte Hope was also really terrible in that series, but at least they went with a redhead for Catherine, which is authentic. Also, I hate the idea that it got people talking, therefore it is fine. That is a terrible way to make a series. It should stand up on its own merits, not rely on outrage to get it noticed. Although I do fear this individual must have low standards if they don't care if the acting is any good. If a slender Irishman as Henry VIII, Superman as, <clears throat> Superman as the Duke of Suffolk, or even a bearded heartthrob as Henry VII of all people is acceptable casting, yet you rage at a black Anne Boleyn in a modern psychological retelling, there's a word for that. Don't raise it! <sighs> Firstly, no. None of those roles are acceptable casting. I did an hour and ten minute video on The White Princess, which included criticism of the casting of Henry VII in that series. I also briefly covered the Tudors in Tudor Rant 1, and I am planning to do a proper breakdown of it in the future, since my first video definitely has some flaws. So don't just assume everyone is okay with inaccurate casting. Oh, and please stop labelling everyone as racist if they don't like this. It makes you look very childish. So yes, overall I am not too happy with the casting. Personally, I think Channel 5 are merely doing this to fuel outrage and thus drive clicks, thus hoping people would watch it. This is not a good strategy to make your series. Aim for quality. Always aim for quality. But Cavalier, it could still be good quality even with the casting. Hmm. Having watched this trailer and reading through some of the articles about the series, I am not so sure. Now I know Hello Magazine is not exactly at the top of academia, but I just have to read some parts from this article on the trailer, and the series as a whole, the hilarious title of which you have already seen. According to the article, For 500 years we have been drip-fed a story about Anne Boleyn, the cold-hearted, scheming seductress who bewitched Henry VIII into marrying her, before sleeping with his best friend. Oh, and her brother. But because history is written by the victors, we have never heard her side of the story. <laughs> Where to start with this drivel? First off, the majority of films and TV series featuring Anne Boleyn as a main character are usually at least somewhat sympathetic to her, and usually show her as actually being innocent of the charges against her, which is the historical consensus in academia from what I can gather. Just off the top of my head, Anne of the Thousand Days, a film from over 50 years ago, is very much on Anne's side. The 1976 Wives series as well is sympathetic to her plight. The only ones I can think of that were a bit more negative about her would be the 1972 Six Wives film, The Other Boleyn Girl, and Wolf Hall to an extent, but even in those ones there is at least some sympathy for her when it comes to her execution. Also, what do you mean that Anne Boleyn slept with Henry's best friend? Henry's best friend was Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, who had married the King's younger sister Mary. Anne never had an affair with him. I assume they're referring to someone like Sir Francis Weston, Henry Norris, or Anne's brother, so I will allow the hyperbole on this occasion. The idea, though, that we have never heard her side of the story is absolute codswallop. The article continues. This series will take you inside her mind and follow events from her perspective. Anne openly dares to see herself as the king's equal. <sighs> no, she did not. She was the consort. He was the king. She always knew her power ultimately rested with Henry. True, she was certainly more outspoken compared to Catherine of Aragon, Well, even Catherine could speak her mind on occasion, her speech in 1529 before the Legatine court being won, but the Tudors did not have modern notions of equality like we do today. Anyway, the article continues. She sees a future in which her daughter, a female, female. could rule. 
but these are dangerous attributes in the Tudor court. A competitive world riddled with misogyny and uh, machismo. Um, m m machismo. Machi Kyoko, there we go. Now, Anne definitely loved her daughter, of course, and the article does say could rule, but I would argue that she definitely wanted the son above all else, since that is what the king wanted, and her future rested upon that. Now, finally, onto the trailer itself. I probably would be okay showing clips, but the YouTube copyright bot is about as merciful as Henry VIII on a bad day. So, just to be safe, I will be putting up screenshots with timestamps to the sections I'm discussing. The link to the trailer itself will be in the description below. I may risk some clips from other productions, but again, that will depend if I can get away with it or not. So, in this part, we see Anne presumably at her trial, in what looks like a local parish church for some reason. I know the Great Hall at the Tower of London, where the actual trial took place, no longer exists, but was a parish church, a religious building with pews, a pulpit, etc., the best place for this? Apparently, the old Great Hall at the Tower looked fairly similar to the one at Winchester, which was built at the same time. I mean, I guess I can see some similarities to the church, but it does not help having the pulpit, pews, etc. here in a hall meant for non-religious occasions. Anyway, what appears to be the court clerk... Wait a minute... Oh, right, according to the IMDb, this is an actor called Barry Ward, and he is meant to be playing Thomas Cromwell, who looks like this. Now, this isn't the first time we've had a Cromwell not looking quite like his historical counterpart. Mark Rylance and Wolf Hall is a fair bit thinner than the real-life one, for example, but they at least made an attempt to bulk him out a bit, so he matches the historical figure, even having a scene where they recreate Holbein painting one of his portraits, and it was balanced by the fact that Mark Rylance is a damn good actor. This Cromwell, though, does not look like it will live up to that, I fear, although we won't truly know till the series releases. Now, I don't know how they're going to do this, since we only have a few short clips in this trailer, but it looks like she's just going to stand at the front of the church with the judges off to the side, I guess. This is all wrong. According to Risley in his chronicle, Here was a great scaffold made in the King's Hall within the Tower of London, and there were made benches and seats for the lords, my lord of Norfolk sitting under the cloth of state, representing there the King's person as High Steward of England and Uncle to the Queen, he holding a long white staff in his hand, and the Earl of Surrey, his son and heir, sitting at his feet before him holding the golden staff for the Earl Marshal of England, which said office the said Duke had in his hands. The Lord Audley, Chancellor of England, sitting on his right hand, and the Duke of Suffolk on his left hand, with other Marquesses, Earls and Lords, every one after their degrees. And first the King's commission was read, and then the Constable of the Tower and the Lieutenant brought forth the Queen, where was made a chair for her to sit down in, and then her indictment was read before her. Now it could be argued that the budget was a bit tight, so they could not do this, but I am not so sure. The 1976 Wives series, which was made on a budget so low that the walls of the tower here are made out of painted plywood, somehow managed to show this minus the canopy of state for Norfolk. In the latter part of the trailer, we see what I believe is her walking away from the bar, and again, I don't see where the judges are. There's one man standing in the pulpit, another over here, and then all these people, so I guess the judge is just going to have to sit in the pews. In the clip, Cromwell says... The charge is treason. How do you plead? To which Anne replies, not guilty. This sounds more like something you would hear in a modern courtroom, not one in the 16th century. Compare this to the 1970 version, where the clerk says, My lord, in the 28th year of the reign of our most gracious king, Henry VIII, here in the tower, be it known, that the Lady Anne, formerly Anne Boleyn, now Queen of England, is charged on the following counts under the statute of treasons which he then reads out numerous charges against her, but Anne responds that they have no right to try her as she is a queen. Now, obviously this trailer is a quick preview, so I assume it will be a bit longer in the actual series, but could we have had something a bit more like that? Even just something a bit simplified like, Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, you are charged on the following counts of treason against our most gracious king, and then have her interrupt proclaiming her innocence in a slightly more passionate way. Something like, I am the queen, what right have you to sit in judgment upon me? It would sound better than her meekly saying, not guilty. Moving on, we get a brief scene of Anne screaming in pain as she suffers another miscarriage, this presuming to be the final one in early 1536, which arguably sealed her fate. Since we are getting this scene, I guess we will be starting off a bit before this, say late 1535, probably meaning this series will have roughly the same time frame as episode 2 of the 1970 Six Wives series. At least we are going to get some historically accurate moments here and there. Following that, we get a clip of Henry VIII, played by Mark Stanley, arguing with Anne, saying, You promised me sons. From the brief scene we get with the king, I am not really overly struck with his performance, nor his suitability to play the king. 
Granted, he looks a lot more accurate than, say, Jonathan Rees Myers, but to me, Mark does not command the physical presence of this larger than life king. Henry VIII was about six foot two, a giant of a man, especially by the standards of the time, and really stood out. This Henry, though, looks like he rather lacks the stature of the king, or at least his presence. His delivery of that line to me also felt rather lacklustre, but hey, we will see when we get the actual series. I'm not too sure what to make of the slap. I think the king would be a tad furious that his wife had dared to do that to him, particularly Henry VIII of all people. Remember, during this time period, the king is the supreme ruler of both church and state, and was seen as an almost divine being. To strike him, even if it was in a private setting, would be a very dangerous thing to do. In Elizabeth's reign, the Earl of Essex got into a lot of trouble for reaching for the hilt of his sword, although since Anne does eventually lose her head, I guess Henry sorted that matter out. We get some lines of dialogue referring to Jane Seymour, who Henry would take as his third wife following Anne's death. There's also a very brief shot of her wearing an inaccurate French hood, more on that later. She's played in this series by Lola Pettigrew, and to be honest, she looks a bit too young to me. Jane was in her late 20s, and Lola is 25, so technically they are more or less correct with the casting, but I don't know. She doesn't really look quite like the historical figure that much. To be fair, though, they do have to show her to be younger than the queen she is going to replace, so I can overlook that if the performance is good. I mean, the acting is going to be good, right? On the screen, a few sentences flash up saying dishonest or devoted, traitor or trailblazer, and sinner or saint. What exactly she is trailblazing, I have no idea. I mean, she was the first English queen to be beheaded, so I guess she was innovative in that regard. We get a scene where Anne proclaims her innocence. I can't be sure, but I'm pretty sure she's talking to Kingston, the constable of the Tower, so this is presumably happening when she enters the Tower of London after her arrest. Of course, I don't think the Tower was known for its nice curvy hedges outside the main gate, but hey-ho, gotta make it look nice and pretty for the prisoners to come in. Now we get this tagline, you may know the history, but you don't know her story. Because, as we all know, the most famous wife of King Henry VIII has never had a movie or TV series made from, or including her point of view. Oh wait, there are actually loads of them, and it has kind of been done to death. I feel sorry for the rest of the wives at this point. After a few lines about fear fueling you to be bigger, or some nonsense like that, we get some shots of what I presume is Anne being held in the tower. In real life, Anne was still technically the queen when she first arrived, and so was housed in the queen's apartments, a complex of buildings that were heavily refurbished and added to in preparation for Anne's coronation in 1533. They would have been pretty up-to-date and luxurious for the time, not some sort of grey, filthy dungeon like we see here. Although this does seem to be a common trend with a lot of Tudor dramas. We now get this little segment showing what I assume is Anne's execution. In real life, Anne probably wore a grey gown to her execution, not black. But some do argue it might have been black, so I won't say anything further. We will get a better idea when the series airs, but I think overall, it looks like it will be hitting the basic points of her execution and how it went. If I do ever cover this series, I will make sure to go into full details then, but I will bring up these brief points for the moment. There is a frame of her having a moment with one of her ladies-in-waiting, something that did not happen as far as I'm aware, and is a scene I expect has been added to modernise it somewhat, although, in the grand scheme of things, it is a rather minor point, and as a push, I could somewhat see it happening. Anne is seen kneeling here, about to be blindfolded before the executioner strikes. It should be noted that she wore a coif over her hair, which was tied up so as not to impede the executioner's sword. A picture released in one of the papers shows this scene from another angle, and, again, her hair is tied up, but not in such a way as I have previously described. In fact, it would probably be getting in the way. Could be worse, I suppose. Now would be a good time to bring up the overall quality of the costumes we've seen in the trailer, and in other promotional material. Broadly, it is not looking too good. During this part of Henry VIII's reign, women always wore what was called a hood, of which there were two main styles in use in England. The English, or gable hood, that looked like this, and the more modern French hood that Anne herself wore quite a bit. Although she certainly wore the English variant as well, judging from one of, if not the only contemporary surviving image of her. In all the pictures I have seen, I have not come across a single English hood, which is not good. We know Jane Seymour wore one, since she wanted to present herself as a traditional English woman, as opposed to Anne. We do get something resembling the French hood, but it is lacking the veil at the back, and is basically nothing more than a glorified headband at this stage. Hell, there are even a few shots where they're not wearing any hoods at all. The dresses as well are very simplified, and do not look like something a queen would be wearing, lacking a lot of furs, jewels, and other more fancy elements. 
although at least the gentleman of the court looks slightly better, and the yeomen here actually don't look too bad. Small mercies and all that. I did bring this up in my Spanish Princess trailer rant, but the modern music throughout the trailer is rather distracting. Granted, trailers often use different music to form that featured in the show itself, but it would really help set the mood better if we had something a bit more inspired by the period. That is why movies like A Man For All Seasons work really well, since the soundtrack often took inspiration from the music of that period, making you feel very much immersed in the world. I am not feeling that at all with this trailer, and I expect the series will be the same. Overall then, we are going to be in for a painful ride when this series comes out later this month. Anne Boleyn looks like it has a very low budget, which is definitely not helping its authenticity, not that they cared much for that in the first place. It is also being made by Channel 5, who are not exactly known for producing their own in-house period dramas, so I fear this first outing will be rather painful for them. In fact, dare I be so bold as to theorise that this series was only made the way it was because they did not have either budget nor the skill to make a good period drama, so simply opted to make as many headlines as they could to drive up views. Time will tell though, but since it is only three episodes and will be purely focused on her downfall, I don't know if there will be enough material for me to do a full Tudor rant video, but we shall see. Well, at least Maid in the Abyss is getting a season 2, The Princess Principal movie is getting a western release, and Overlord a season 4 and a movie. Soon the world will meet Best Girl and learn that His Majesty is Justice. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.